So the size of the cannula is directly related to the weeks. So for six uh, weeks it is six millimeters, for eight it is eight and for ten it is ten. It is as simple as that. So cannula uh, goes with the uh, you know it's easier to say that if you are having a doubt if you don't have the size then go for the bigger one rather than going for the smaller one. Hi students, welcome back. We'll now do the discussions of Obzingani MCQs which came in December 21 for the MCI exam and uh, we were expecting these questions, weren't we? Just the kind of questions you want to see in any of the subjects. Obzingani, uh, most students said that it saved their exam in a way because uh, they were expected questions and most of these questions we have discussed in the app. So I'm happy that you could correlate with the discussions which we had and most of them uh, also were discussed in the forums so many times. But yes, there were a couple of surprises, which is always uh, good because uh, when you know these surprises, you read about them, you read about these new topics and you prepare for the next exam better. And the next exam is the PG entrance exam, isn't it? You're all preparing for the PG entrance exam, I'm sure, because all of you are going to make it. Best wishes for that. And uh, let's start uh, discussing about the questions which came in this exam. So the first question was, of course, the question you were expecting throughout the year. According to the recent updates of the MTP Act in 2021, a registered medical practitioner can terminate a pregnancy up to how many weeks? So earlier it was 20 weeks, now it's been pushed to 24 weeks and if it's 24 weeks, then two doctors are required to make the decision and supervise the abortion. And uh, we know that the Act was passed uh, by the Parliament and signed by the President in uh, the month of March 2021. So, uh, you know, it was uh, published in the Gazette of the Country. And uh, once this uh, act was passed, you know, the wordings, if you want me to just tell you a little bit, that uh, termination of pregnancy can be done by a registered medical practitioner where the length of the pregnancy does not exceed 20 weeks or where the length of the pregnancy exceeds 20 weeks but does not exceed 24 weeks in case of such category of woman as may be prescribed by rules made under this act if not less than two registered medical practitioners are involved. So that is the latest amendment and uh, yes, it has to be implemented yet and so when we are saying that an abortion can be done from 20 to 24 weeks, it has to be approved by a board and that board has to be constituted by the uh, state and the board should have doctors, should have a pediatrician, a gynecologist and should have a, uh, a woman activist who knows about the act well and can take care of women rights and speak about them and make this woman understand uh, uh, good and bad when she's making such a decision. So, uh, you know, uh, this kind of board will approve that an abortion between 20 to 24 weeks can be done. So, yes, implementation of this act is going to still take uh, some time, but it has been approved by the government. So, uh, that's why this question has already come in exams. Okay. And uh, beyond 24 weeks also, sometimes you can do an abortion, but that is only if it's a totally non-viable fetus. That if something like an encephaly is there and it, is, it was missed, the woman is in the village and she somehow came to the, uh, you know, the city for some ultrasound. And in the ultrasound, it was seen that at 26 weeks, the baby is an encephaly pregnancy. Then there's no point continuing that pregnancy. Again, somebody has to approve this. The board has to approve this. Only then you can do such abortions also. But yes. Uh, regular abortions only till 24 weeks when approved by a board and uh, that's what is the carry home message regarding this topic. Okay, so question number two, which of the following is an absolute contraindication to IUCD insertion? Now, IUCD insertion, I'm so happy this came up because every time I discuss IUCDs with you, some of you will say that IUCDs increase the chance of ectopic pregnancies. Now, this is what we've discussed many times that when IUCDs are used, pregnancies are less ectopic pregnancies are lesser. Yes, if at all there is a failure of an IOCD, then the likelihood of an ectopic is slightly more than normal pregnancies. In a normal woman who gets pregnant without an IOCD, the chance of an ectopic is 1 to 2 percent. If there is an IOCD failure, then the chance of ectopic becomes 5 percent to 6 percent. That's all. So overall, pregnancy is less, ectopics less. If at all a woman conceives with an IOCD in C2, rule out an ectopic. That's what has been taught to you many times in the uh, classes. Okay. So, previous ectopic pregnancy is not a contraindication. Okay. Now, unexplained vaginal bleeding is the answer to this MCQ. This is the definite most 
uh, important uh, you know aspect because we all remember that the most common side effect of an ICD insertion is excessive vaginal bleeding. So, when there is unexplained vaginal bleeding, I will definitely not put an ICD. That's the answer. Now, history of previous PID. Patient had a PID is not a contraindication. If she's having currently a PID, then I would say, okay, fine, don't give an ICD. Previous PID is nowhere a contraindication, and even an HIV positive patient can have an ICD. So, yes, let me explain that to you with some uh, information about the medical eligibility criteria you know all uh, contraceptive measures are uh, given this mech 1 2 3 and 4 kind of classification and medical eligibility criteria one means a condition for which there is no restriction for use of the contraceptive method which we are discussing and uh, mech 2 means a condition where the advantages are more than the risk and mech 3 is where the risks are more than the advantages and mech 4 is a total absolute contraindication so when we discuss about things like pelvic inflammatory diseases then you can see past PID is MEC1 there is no contraindication that means you can safely use this contraception if there was past PID so past PID previous PID is not a problem and um, current PID yes it is MEC4 so definitely you cannot start you know I is for initiation and C is for continuity of the contraceptive method so definitely there's a contraindication if there's a ongoing PID so we cannot initiate a IUCD insertion if there's an ongoing PID previous PID no contraindication and uh, again uh, when I'm talking about uh, current purulent cervicitis obviously it's a contraindication but if there was previous STD and there was no other problem then we will not say that we will have a contraindication now high risk of HIV not a straight away indication to use but then the benefits outweigh the risk so we will use it MEC2 is safe and asymptomatic or mild HIV clinical disease again MEC2 so we can initiate and we can continue okay we have just not discussed in this that an HIV positive status is not a contraindication that's what I'm trying to show you here with the proof okay this is the uh, category of uh, the reasons and another one is regarding the use of this in previous ectopic pregnancy look here past ectopic pregnancy is mech 1 initiation and mech 1 for continuity so you can give an IUCD if there was a previous ectopic pregnancy and there is no contraindication okay so I hope you're all clear with the choices here and the answer is unexplained vaginal bleeding where we should not give an IUCD rest all the other three choices which you've given we can give an IUCD all right so question number three a female undergoing in vitro fertilization was given injection HCG for ovulation trigger now presents with nausea vomiting headache the ultrasound pelvis done shows some ascites and the ovaries looks like the image shown below what is the most probable diagnosis now this ultrasound is showing us ovary which is much enlarged and there are multiple follicles if you can see there's so many follicles which are much bigger than the antral follicle size they are huge follicles all right so these follicles if you see they are so big and um, that shows there are many mature follicles in one ovary now this is a two-dimensional picture of the ovary there will be some follicles even behind in this ovary then there's another ovary so if a woman has too many follicles which are mature then we say that they are just too many follicles making too much of estrogen and the patient is going into ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome okay now this is not a case of PCOS PCOS the ovary will be somewhat different the ovary will be like this with multiple small follicles in the periphery yes we all agree that a PCOS patient can have more chance of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome that part we agree very much but then this picture which we have shown here is definitely not PCOS it's not a theca lutein cyst it will be a large clear cyst theca lutein cyst and serous cyst adenoma will be much bigger unilocular cyst so this is definitely a case of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome and we have been discussing this in the app uh, and uh, in so many forums where we've met please remember when we talk about the pathophysiology of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome it is mostly the high estrogens and the high hcg which we have to remember so i've already made a graphic so that you we waste less time in explaining so i'm trying to just show you that there's a woman with pcos 
who underwent um, the stimulation for uh, making more follicles for IVF because in IVF we need more follicles because more follicles mean more eggs and more eggs means better chances of success of IVF. So I give her injection FSH and she makes a lot of follicles. See, so many follicles have been made. Now each follicle makes around 200 micrograms of estradiol. So when there's too much of estrogen, like I've shown you here, and when there is uh, more than normal amount of vascular endothelial growth factor there is increase in the vascular permeability when there is increase in the vascular permeability i'm showing you here that the fluids move out from the intravascular component so the intravascular component has hemoconcentration and fluids start moving out into the third space like i've shown you the fluids have the yellow color fluids have come out i'm trying to show you here so these fluids will now start accumulating in the third space so third space collections will also increase causing ascites pleural effusion pericardial effusion and edema so yes tense ascites and uh, that will impair the proper breathing of the woman then uh, pleural effusion that will also impair the lung expansion and pericardial effusion will reduce the cardiac function so all of this can even cause a woman to have very severe respiratory compromise and she can even die because of that so uh, also that the hemoconcentration which i've shown you here hemoconcentration means there will be a paxil volume of more than 45 or even more than 55 sometimes and that concentrated blood can cause a formation of a thrombus and thromboembolic phenomena can happen that can also cause death and then third point is that this large ovary this large ovary which is attached to the uterus which is small ovary and ligament can undergo a torsion and that can cause rupture and hemorrhage so that can also cause death of the patient with ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome now yes uh, i'm telling you the worst case scenario of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome in this picture there is also a mild variety then a moderate variety a severe variety and then a critical variety so i've shown you the severe and the critical but yes mild and moderate also exist and mild and moderate are the more common ones more common type of ovarian hyperstimulation which you see in practice so please remember that uh, clomphene citrate is one of the most common causes of ovarian hyperstimulation but that is a mild type and injection FSH or the recombinant FSH causes the more severe type of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome all right so let's move on and see question number four all of the following regarding non-scalpel vasectomy are correct except now non-scalpel vasectomy is uh, the type of vasectomy which we are doing these days where we just give a local anesthesia in the uh, around the vas uh, bilaterally and uh, the patient can have an outpatient uh, kind of a procedure where a vasectomy can be done easily it's a much lesser complicated surgery as compared to a tubectomy for a woman and we should promote vasectomies and i have told you many times that vasectomy has no serious side effects and it's a much uh, shorter and safer surgery and men don't have any problems in their you know day-to-day -day activities or in their sexual activities or in their sexual performance for that matter uh, all those things are you know there is so much of uh, folklore which is against vasectomy and that's what you and me have to fight against we must teach the society that vasectomy is a much safer operation versus a tubectomy for a woman so about a vasectomy which is uh, uh, incorrect all of the following are correct except so which is an incorrect statement hematoma can occur up to five percent of the patients uh, maybe uh, five is a little high but then up to five percent i will not say it is wrong so this is a correct statement sexual function falling healing is rarely affected it is not affected rarely also is not a good uh, word here it is not affected at all yes for the first few days if he's got pain and he tries to have sex then maybe that is going to cause some discomfort but eventually there's no problem with a vasectomy regarding sexual function sterility immediately after a vasectomy now this is a wrong statement because recanalization is possible surgical recanalization of a tubectomy or a vasectomy can be done you and me have discussed about that but uh, sterility immediately after vasectomy is strong when you do a vasectomy then the distal part you know if you see the vas like this so if i do the vasectomy let's say here through a local then the sperms which are in the tract here the sperm which are distal to the block those sperms can go out in the next few ejaculates and cause conception in the woman so we always say that sterility is not immediately after vasectomy we should always tell the man to 
wait for three months. Three months it may take for the, uh, you know, the distal pa passage to be totally uh, ridden off the sperms. So, three months or we say 20 ejaculates. Three months or 20 ejaculates is the time taken for the sperms to get totally empty from this tract and then the man is known to be safe when he's having coitus. So for these three months or 20 ejaculates, he is told to use a condom and that is what is the method. After these uh, three months or 20 ejaculates, we tell the man to come for a semen analysis. We do one semen analysis and mostly ideally we should do two semen analysis to term azospermia. So we should do a semen analysis and then see if there are any sperms or not. Once you are sure that there is no sperms, then you give him a certificate, you know, in his uh, uh, vasectomy certificate, you have to write that yes, uh, test was done and he was found to be azospermic. Now he is a person who is sterile. So that certificate has to be given after three months. Okay, so the answer for this question is C. Now, female sterilization versus vasectomy, once again, I want to revise that there is a 20-fold increased complication rate in the female sterilization, 10 to 37 increased failure rate in uh, female sterilization versus a vasectomy and it costs three times more. These are figures straight from your Williams obstetrics. Please remember, uh, a tubectomy for a woman is more scary, more complications as compared to a vasectomy for a man. Okay. Now, question number five, which is the recommended dose of folic acid in a female with history of neurodew defect in the last pregnancy? So, the requirement of folic acid in pregnancy per day, we know, is 0.4 milligrams. That is the requirement. And the replacement is 4 milligrams. So, daily requirement of folic acid in pregnancy is 0.4 and the replacement is 4 milligrams. So, yes, when you want to give a replacement for a woman who had neural tube defects in the last pregnancy, we say that ideally, ideally it is 3 months of folic acid, 4 milligrams per day. That is what is ideal. Uh, but if that kind of time is not there, at least, at least 1 month of folic acid supplementation 4 milligrams per day and then in the pregnancy also we continue as much so that uh, there is lesser chances of neural tube defects. Uh, this is a fairly simple question you people knew this uh, uh, you were happy to get such a question in the exam isn't it. Uh, so that was straightforward kind of an answer. Maximum amount of amniotic fluid is seen at what gestation age? Now this uh, gestational age and amniotic fluid, uh, I have been drawing these graphs so many times in the you know classes and I have been telling you that the maximum amount of amniotic fluid which is around 1000 ml is at 32 to 34 weeks and then at around 36 weeks starts uh, to reduce a little. So we say it's around 800 ml here and then at 40 weeks it's around 600 to 800 ml. So after 32 34 weeks it starts to reduce in amount so i have always given this range and yes most of us we always say that if there's a choice between 32 to 34 please mark 34 that's where the amniotic fluid is maximum now i was surprised that when we, i was doing the zoom discussion immediately after the exams where i was uh, you know discussing the recall questions with uh, you students most of you have told me that 34 was not even a choice so yes that broke my heart a little bit but then yes, if uh, 32 or 34 is given, then one of you, one of them uh, will be given as the choices. Please remember, they will not give both the choices because between 32 to 34, it's really difficult to choose. So I'm happy that they've given you one and 32 is the answer for this question. I'm sure that in some other forum, they'll give you 34. But yes, if they really give you 32 to 34, I would still say mark 34. Here, the choice was very nice. It was 32. So go ahead and mark 32 here. And if there's a choice between 32 and 34, go ahead and mark 34. Mm, that kind of uh, choice, I, it's unfair to give you in the exam. So yes, that's why they give you a choice which was clear. 32 weeks is the time when the amniotic fluid is maximum. So that's why I tell you that at 36 weeks, when the amount of liquor is 800 ml, then we can try and do external cephalic versions. Why we can do? Now the baby is bigger and the liquor is becoming lesser. So when you turn the baby, suppose the baby is a breech presentation at 36 weeks, then if you turn the baby, he will stay turned. It will not return back to the breech. So when there's a breech and I want to do a normal vagina delivery, 
I can do, but it's better that I do a cephalic vaginal delivery. So to make a breech cephalic, I can turn it. That is what is known as the external cephalic version. And that is not done at 32 or 33 weeks because like it is increasing at that time and the baby will return back. So that's why we do external cephalic versions at 36 weeks or 37 weeks sometimes because now the baby is bigger like it is reducing so when you turn it the baby will stay turned and the breech will stay cephalic once you've turned it all right that's the importance of this amniotic fluid so at 12 weeks the amniotic fluid is around uh, at 12 weeks it's around 50 ml and at 24 weeks it's around 500 ml and at 36 weeks it's around 1000 ml that's one way to remember things and at around um, you know this uh, 36 weeks i've just told you it's around 800 yes uh, this is one another way of remembering things 50 500 and 1000 that's uh, one uh, uh, you know uh, mnemonic kind of thing that you people should remember that at 12 weeks it is how much and 24 weeks it is how much that's why i told you in fact uh, they've asked you even at 20 weeks sometimes at 20 weeks it's around 400 ml so 20 weeks around 400 ml and at uh, 36 weeks around 800 to 1000 ml maximum it's around 32 to 34 weeks okay so uh, what is the contribution of the amniotic fluid uh, what is giving the contribution you know that fetal urine uh, in second trimester onwards the maximum amount of amniotic fluid which is present is because of the fetal urine so let us see what is adding and what is reducing the amniotic fluid so fetal urination is causing production of the amniotic fluid it's around 1000 ml per day and fetal lung secretions is around um, 350 ml that is also adding to the amniotic fluid but yes fetal swallowing fetal swallowing is reducing the amniotic fluid by 750 ml the baby will swallow the amniotic fluid will also take it to the lungs and that amniotic fluid is life for the baby because that amniotic fluid when it is uh, taken into the lung is going to cause the expansion of the lung and cause lung development so that swallowing is helpful for the lung development and then flow across the plasmid surface that is also resorption which is around 400 ml per day so around 1350 is the production and 1150 is the resorption so net uh, 100 to 200 ml is the uh, excess is the is the increase in the amniotic fluid every day so why is there flow across the plasmid surface now that we can understand by the uh, osmolality of the fluids so the fetal uh, serum and the metal serum is around 280 milliosmoles per ml and the amniotic fluid the amniotic fluid which is basically fetal urine is hypotonic it is hypotonic versus the fetal serum so this hypotonicity will make the fluids go from the amniotic sac across the fetal uh, plasmal uh, fetal and plasmal blood vessels and go into the fetal circulation that hypotonicity of the amniotic fluid will be also a factor where the fluids move from the amniotic sac into the fetal circulation so that's the reason of flow across the plasmal surface all right so let's take the next question question number seven which of the following is an indication for surgery in an ectopic pregnancy for a woman who is desirous for another pregnancy now when we talk of a pregnancy in the fallopian tube if it is ruptured then i told you there's only one management and that is to remove the tube and throw it off but if it is unruptured then we try to save it so that can be saved by uh, you know uh, medical methods or by surgical methods we know that very well and uh, that's what is the punchline which I wanted to give you that if it is unruptured tube try and save the tube medically you can uh, you know kill the baby by methotrexate and the baby uh, dies and it is absorbed by the uh, body uh, system and it is uh, the macrophages will eat up the the dead tissues but if it is a, a baby which is too large then we can surgically remove the baby and still save the tube now that is the basics now what they're asking in this question uh, you know the choices are not recalled very well here and i wish i had better choices but uh, they're asking you which of the following is indication for surgery in ectopic pregnancy uh, when we are actually trying to do a conservative management and try to save the tube which of the following uh, criteria here tell us that we should do a surgical conservation than a medical conservation i think that's what is the question here so serum beta hcg less than thousand i can do medical patient wants to continue pregnancy 
I don't understand this choice at all. And ectopic mass more than 4 centimeters definitely is the indication for me to do a surgery. So I think uh, this one choice was recalled properly by the students who gave the exam that yes sir there was a choice which said more than 4 centimeters. So yes that if you mark that I am happy that if a pregnancy is too big then we can conserve the tube but by a surgical method. So let me explain that to you that uh, if we are trying to save the tube when we try to save the tube we can try and save it by medical methods that we can give the uh, you know the patient methotrexate into her circulation and that methotrexate will kill the pregnancy or we can give KCL directly into the sac and then we can try even uh, mifepristone or we can try prostaglandins all these methods are tried but then the best method and the best results we've got is always by methotrexate now what is the surgical method surgical method which i told you is to take the fetus out and save the tube so that is linear salping goes to me you know in linear salping goes to me suppose uh, this is the uterus and there's a fallopian tube with the ectopic so in this uh, uh, fallopian tube with the ectopic we make a linear incision like this we make an incision like this and we open the tube take the baby out and leave the incision uh, we just cauterize around this and with that we can uh, make sure that the baby is out and the bleeding stops and with this a small incision which is made on the tube it doesn't spoil the tube and this tube can be actually used by the patient for having another pregnancy in the uterus next time all right so linear salping ostomy is the surgical procedure of choice and then we have the resection anastomosis that also is a procedure which can be done for surgical conservation and milking was one method which I have always told you that it can be done milking of tube but that milking can damage the tube you know you're milking the ectopic out you're squeezing the tube and pushing the baby out now that milking will squeeze the tube too much and cause damage of the tube and next time there might be more ectopics so milking of the tube is something which I don't want you people to learn okay so we can save the tube by medical methods or by surgical methods that's what I wanted to tell you in this question the choices were not so bright and uh, if uh, I want to tell you the criteria where I want to do medical and surgical that is what is important if you remember the criteria then any MCQ which comes in the exam properly in good language that you can easily solve so this question the choices are not uh, nicely given to me I'll just tell you the criteria the size of the ectopic should be 4 centimeters and less for medical management if it is more than 4 centimeters then I do surgical management if the HCG is 5000 milli international units if it is less than that I can do medical if it is more than that I will do surgical management and if the cardiac activity of the fetus if the cardiac activity of the fetus is absent then I can do medical if it is present then I can do surgical management so this will help us decide the method of uh, management of the unruptured tube and uh, uh, you know either way I am trying to save the tube that is what is the punchline you should remember for unruptured ectopic. If it is ruptured ectopic chop the tube do a total salpingectomy no partial salpingectomy okay always completely remove a ruptured tube don't leave a stump please that stump is only going to cause another ectopic. All right so uh, now this is one question which keeps coming in every alternative exam and you know the answer very well minimal prenatal visits which are uh, you know we say in the, um, the in the in countries where, which are resource poor countries and patients are not going to follow up too much of your advice then at least these many visits can ensure that we are able to give the basic uh, treatment for a pregnancy and basic surveillance can be done so that basic visit should be how much so according to the WHO the focused ANC model they have asked I think they asked you in the exam WHO uh, the focused ANC model I think they asked you these words F A N C that's what uh, somebody tells me it was written but even if it was not written the minimal visits most of the patients we say at least four times they must come to the OPD ideal visits should be 
more than that isn't it idle visit should be up to eight so that's what i'm trying to tell you in this uh, chart that uh, in the focused anc model we say first trimester visit should be around eight to twelve weeks when we can do an ultrasound for the localization of the fetus and find out history of exposure to drugs and any radiation or any fever with, with uh, uh, exanthems on the body all that uh, you know torch infections all that in history we can take in the first trimester and the second trimester around 24 to 26 weeks we can give some immunization and do the screening for gdm check the blood pressure again ask for history of bleeding and all in uh, early pregnancy and then third trimester around 32 weeks we can see the growth of the fetus maybe maybe we can also repeat an ultrasound for uh, finding out the uh, growth if it is tallying with the number of weeks so we can rule out an IUGR if they come at least around 30 to 32 weeks once to the OPD and at 36 37 weeks we can in the fourth visit we can assess if the head is going to the pelvis or not if the pelvis is adequate for this uh, baby or not around 37 weeks we can do a PV and plan a, a normal delivery or a cesarean if required okay so it is uh, supposed to be good if they do at least four visits ideal is that they must have eight visits and that is uh, you know in 12 weeks there should be one visit at least and then second visit at 20 weeks third visit at 24 weeks fourth at 30 weeks fifth at 34 weeks sixth at 36 seventh at 38 and eighth visit at 40 weeks so this is what is the ideal kind of visits and uh, mostly nowadays in the metropolitan cities they come even more than these eight visits but uh, ideal is eight visits and at least is four visits so those who marked uh, four b is uh, they're all correct that is the correct answer all right question number nine cardiac output comes to normal after how many days after delivery now there was some controversy because uh, some people thought uh, that it should be around 15 days some people even thought it should be 21 days but uh, please uh, be rest assured that uh, when we have such controversies the book to refer in obstetrics is Williams Obstetrics and whenever you have a doubt just go and see and it is written very categorically in that book and that's what we've been telling you that at 10 days the cardiac output comes back to normal all right so yes cardiac output increases in pregnancy around 32 weeks it is maximum 7.1 liters per minute then in labor it is 8.9 but immediately postpartum it is 9.3 so in the antenatal time it's around 32 weeks it is the maximum amount of uh, cardiac output in labor it is even more and in postnatal it is even more than the labor in antenatal time so if they ask you uh, you know when is the uh, cardiac output maximum throughout pregnancy and delivery then it is immediately postpartum when it is more than 70 percent increase in cardiac output at this time more than 70 percent increase in the immediate postpartum but if they ask you only antenatal time then you must say at 32 weeks now when does it come down blood volume comes down to non-pregnant level by one week and the cardiac output declines to non-pregnant values by 10 days like what i told you just now and the heart rate and blood pressure also follow the same pattern of coming back to normal in the first 10 days after the delivery all right now question number 10 uh, i hope the font is not too small here a lady presented with complaints of foul smelling grayish white discharge and a whiff test done on the discharge was positive so whiff test is positive and this grayish white discharge and uh, on examination clue cells were seen i mean they've given you all the hints which uh, are required for a diagnosis of uh, bacterial vaginosis also known as gardenella vaginalis so uh, what is the condition what is the drug of choice so fairly simple question that uh, bacterial vaginosis caused uh, by the hemophilus vaginalis also known as the gardenella vaginalis and the treatment of choice is metronidazole now how do we diagnose this you all know the amsels criteria we know that uh, three or more are required out of these five that the ph should be more than 4.5 you know pertaining towards uh, uh, alkalinity you know the ph is around 4.5 it is acidic and if it is more than 7 it is alkaline and that causes bacteriogenosis but it should not just be more than 7 every time it can be a little bit more than 4.5 let's say 5 or 5.5 so it is relatively alkaline that relative alkalinity also causes bacterial and even trichomoniasis 
So it is a pH which is alkaline. There's a fishy vaginal odor. Vaginal secretions are grayish, creamish, uh, grayish in color, creamy in consistency. And adding potassium hydroxide to these vaginal secretions releases ammonical smell. And that is what is known as the WIF test, classical of bacterial vaginosis. And microscopic uh, examination reveals an increased number of clue cells. You know, clue cells are the vaginal epithelial cells which are emitted by many many bacteria all over the periphery like that you will see a cell which has got numerous bacteria which are attached to this surface so that's what gives us a clue so that's a clue cell so any three of these uh, five is uh, what is known as the answer criteria any three of these five is required for the diagnosis of bacterial vaginosis all right a lady with infertility undergoes a laparoscopy for the purpose of assessment of her pelvic anatomy. For tubal patency, a chromotubation involves pushing dye from a cannula in the cervix, which is observed to come out from the fallopian tubes. This chromotubation or chromopertubation, like some people say, is usually done using which of the following? So yes, uh, this is the uh, you know the uh, uh, very important procedure by which we assess the anatomy of a woman yes we can assess the anatomy by a simple histosalpingography also but that is very preliminary it just tells you about the tubal patency and the cavity but when you do a laparoscopy you know if this is the uterus with the laparoscope you can see the shape of the uterus the fallopian tubes and the uh, tubes if they are healthy or they are beaded and then the tubo over in relation the uh, surrounding pelvic viscera if the additions to the tubes and the tubes are badly stuck and uh, assessment of other parts of the pelvis and of the abdomen all of that can be done by a laparoscopy and while i'm doing the laparoscopy my assistant from below will put a, a cannula into the cervix and she'll put in some dye and i can see the dye coming out from the fallopian tube so i can even also know the tubal patency so that's why laparoscopy is a much better test than a histosalpingography. And what is the dye which we use? The dye which we use is methylene blue dye. All right. So um, yes, this is the uh, laparoscopy where I'm, uh, you know, the I'm showing you the Paul to Douglas with the laparoscope, and I'm trying to see the tube on the left side. You see, some dye has already come here. Can you see? So what you want to see doesn't happen most of the times. I'm trying to see the dye coming out from here, but it has come from the right side. I'm squeezing now this tube to see this. Uh, some dye has come to in the uh, in the end of the tube, but not through. So I'm trying to squeeze and see that if it can come. You see, when I sque squeeze, some amount of dye came out from the left side, but the left tube is not looking too good here, and the right tube you can see is showing good amount of dye coming out. So that is what is known as the chromopertubation. There's a routine procedure in the infertility clinic. All right. So let's see question number twelve. Colposcopy filter. What is the color? Uh, now, when you're doing colposcopy, we are looking at the cervix in the vagina under magnification. And when we use filters, it will enhance some features. So, mostly the green filter is used to enhance the blood vessels. But mind you, you can also use the blue filter. And green and blue both were the choices. So, yes, by habit, we always use the green filter. And I'm very happy using the green filter to see the blood vessels and the branching patterns and the angles of the blood vessels which are shown. So, there's so many things which you can do with a colposcope. And uh, this is the first time when I've seen a question, particularly asking about the process of colposcopy. So, now this is something which uh, is now getting interesting that uh, when you go for the PG entrance exam, please don't miss out on reading a little bit more about colposcopy than you usual because yes colposcopic directed biopsy is the management of CIN3 also if there's a post coital bleeding yes you will do a colposcopic biopsy all those all these things have been coming in your exams and the INICD exam is the you know the exam which is giving you the uh, all the controversies are getting settled with the INICD exam regarding these questions which I just not told you because quite a few of you feel that when there's a post coital bleeding you should do a pap smear post coital bleeding please the patient is symptomatic do a diagnostic test and that is again a colposcopy so yes now they're asking you about colposcopy and the green filter is the one which is used for enhancing the blood vessel patterns and seeing the branching pattern and the angles also. So that is where the green filter is uh, used. So answer is the green filter. But yes, uh, when we do the colposcopic examination, what are the you know the uh, uh, the endpoints we're looking at? What are we trying to derive with the colposcopy? That's what I'm telling you here. That the examination of the cervix and the upper vagina with magnification after application of three to five percent of acetic acid using white light under green 
or blue filter both can be used but yes green is the one which is commonly used by most of us minimal elements of a colposcopic examination should include what what are the endpoints in a colposcopic exam that we should be able to visualize the squamo columnar junction yeah that's the point where the displacer is going to start for the first time so that visualization is important of the squamo columnar junction and then identification of the estrobite epithelium or the brown epithelium when we put the schiller's iodine that should be able to be done by the colposcopy and by the end of colposcopy you should be able to derive whether it's a normal one or has some benign changes or there's a low grade high grade uh, ep uh, intraepithelial neoplasia or there's a frank cancer so those are the endpoints you want to derive when you're doing a colposcopy so next question was about the hypertensive drug of choice now again like the question of the amniotic fluid you wanted to uh, write 34 weeks but then 32 was a choice now hypertensive drug of choice in pregnancy all of us know it is labradolol but then they did not give you this choice so i'm thinking that they've just picked up some question from a very old question bank and given you and uh, yes uh, it just uh, goes on to say that my favorite drug uh, has been asked i always tell you in the classes that my personal favorite is methyl dopa and i still want to give this drug regularly to the patients who have uh, pih uh, which is more appropriately called the preeclamptic toxemia now so yes methyl dopa is the drug of choice which is uh, asked in this uh, exam because labetalol is not there simply because of that reason now methyl dopa is a time tested drug it is given in dose of 250 milligrams to 500 milligrams QID dose. It's a QID dose and it takes around 48 hours, 24 to 48 hours to start showing good effect. Okay. Now, this methyl dopa is an analog of 3,4-dihydroxyphenylalanine and it has a clonidine-like alpha-2 agonist action. And the most common side effect is the drowsiness and then there is some depression also. Along with that, there could be some lapses of memory, uh, decreased mental acuity. Uh, there is some nightmares, vertigo, reversible mild psychosis. This mild psychosis came as a question once. Which of the following antihypertensive drugs used in pregnancy can cause some amount of psychosis? So that is where methyl dopa is the answer. And also one more thing you must remember that methyl dopa, uh, you know, ingestion is known to give a false positive Coombs test. That's what we used to be taught. It gives a false positive Coombs test because it really does not not cause any significant uh, problems in the RBCs and uh, rarely there is some hemolysis. So this positive Coombs test is seen in quite a few patients with methyl dopa usage. So we used to be told that it's a false positive Coombs test. All right. Now a lady passes urine while coughing or laughing. What is that known as? So you know the urethrovesicle angle is something like this, and whenever the woman coughs, this. Uh, you know, there are muscles around the urethrovesical angle like this, known as the pubovesicalis. So, that is got a hammock kind of an action, you know. If you see with my hand, something like this, I'm trying to show you my hand as the bladder and this is the urethra. So, if you see the angle of the urethra and the bladder, if it is around 85 degrees. So, what happens? That every time the woman coughs, the muscles of the pelvis will contract. So, this is the pubovesicalis and when the woman coughs, it's like this. <laughs> <laughs> this is the action. So the muscle will make sure that the urethra goes up a little and it doesn't have a direct straightening of uh, with the bladder. So this urethra and the vesicle angle, this urethra vesicle angle is protective against a incontinence. Now, when a woman has delivered many times, multiparous woman, she's got a prolapse, then there's a straightening of this angle. Straightening of this angle, you can see that the bladder and the urethra are in straight, uh, uh, you know, the angle has straightened much. So, when there is straightening of this angle and the woman coughs, <coughs> the bladder will compress and that compression will release some urine out of the urethra because of the anatomy has now straightened up. So, normally this angle, if you see this angle, normally this angle is around 85 degrees. Now, if this angle gets straightened, you can well imagine if this angle is straightened like this. If this angle is now straightened a lot, more than 110 degrees, they say sometimes. So, if it is more than 110 degrees, that straightening of the angle will cause the escape of urine. That's what is known as the stress urinary incontinence. Urge incontinence or the overactive bladder is the, con the answer to this question is stress urinary incontinence. All of you know that. 
Now, the overactive bladder or the urge incontinence is the condition where the woman is feels, uh, feels like passing urine. She has the urge to pass urine. But before she reaches the bathroom, she uh, involuntarily passes urine. She cannot hold it that long. That's what is known as urge incontinence. And uh, urethrovaginal fistula is incontinence which is continuous. And that is, uh, there is uh, some amount of urine always coming out from the uh, urethra into the vagina that will be a I think they wanted to say vesicovaginal fistula I think urethrovaginal fistula is not so common but uh, urethrovaginal fistula or a vesicovaginal fistula whichever fistula they gave you in that there is continuous dribbling so not like a in uh, you know uh, incontinence which is related to cuffing in uh, vesicovaginal fistula or urethrovaginal fistula there will be a constant dribbling of urine and reflex incontinence is something like a urge incontinence but then in reflex incontinence, there is no sensation. In urge incontinence, there is a sensation. There is a, a desire for the woman to pass urine, but she is not able to hold the urine. And she uh, the urine passes before she reaches the bathroom. But yes, in a reflex incontinence, without knowing, without the urge, there is uh, large amounts of urine passed without the patient getting to know about it. Because there could be some spinal injury or there could be some multiple sclerosis where there is a problem in the uh, nerve supply of the bladder and the sensation of filling up is not so good. So that reflex kind of incontinence can happen. So yes, uh, that uh, reflex incontinence and this uh, urge incontinence is almost always discussed together. But in urge, there is a sensation to pass and in reflex, there is no such sensation, there is no such realization. Okay, so the answer to this question is stress urinary incontinence and there are many good surgeries like to discuss in the app where we can lift the bladder neck and help in uh, reducing the uh, urinary incontinence. You know, we have discussed about the needle suspension procedures and we discussed about the ventral suspension. All right, now question number 15, size of the common cannula, uh, yes, common can be with a K or with a C. So mostly I refer it to be a Carmen cannula. And this is the spelling which came to me from the students who gave the exam. So, size of the common cannula at 8 weeks to use for suction evacuation is what? 8 millimeters. So, the size of the cannula is directly related to the weeks. So, for 6 uh, weeks it is 6 millimeters, for 8 it is 8 and for 10 it is 10. It is as simple as that. So, cannula uh, goes with the uh, you know, it's easier to say that if you are having a doubt, if you don't have the size, then go for the bigger one rather than going for the smaller one. So, if it is uh, 8 weeks, you go for the 8 mm cannula. If you don't have 8, go for the 10. Don't go for the 6, okay. As the baby becomes bigger, the tissues become harder. So, a bigger cannula would always help. So, these are the common cannulas and these are used, uh, you can use these cannulas to attach onto a, onto a tube which is generating uh, a vacuum through a electrical generator or you can use it for a, a manual vacuum aspirator, you know, that syringe on which you can put this uh, cannula and that syringe will have a negative pressure with that syringe. So, what is known as a manual vacuum aspirator. Either way, the common cannula can be used and the size of the cannula is just the size, sorry, prep team again. And the size of the cannula is chosen according to the number of weeks the patient is pregnant, all right. Which of the following condition requires a serial determination of a pregnancy test? Where would you, uh, in this, which of these four conditions you will repeatedly do a pregnancy test? Now, in RH incompatibility, I would not do a pregnancy test regularly because in RH incompatibility, I want to see whether the antibodies are increasing. So, if at all I want to do a regular serial estimation, I will do of the antibodies formed. So, not of the pregnancy test. So, this is wrong. Molar pregnancy, yes, I want to do a serial pregnancy test because with molar pregnancy, I want the SCG to, uh, you know, progressively go on reducing. So, in molar pregnancy, we know in a complete mole, a follow-up is required for, uh, you know, at least six months. Ideal, at least ideal, ideal follow-up is one year, but at least six months you should follow. And uh, complete mole, the HCG comes to normal 9 weeks and in partial mole the HCG comes to normal in 7 weeks. 
So that's why we'll keep doing this test on a weekly basis. Once there's a uh, molar evacuation, we'll do this test on a weekly basis. So that's the question, which of the following condition a serial determination of pregnancy test is done or a beta HCG is done. So that is where is the answer lying. It is in molar pregnancy. Viability of a pregnancy, yes, uh, the level of HCG is no guarantee that the high level of HCG is no guarantee that the pregnancy is live or dead. No, that does not happen. It does not correlate too well. Gender identification, please, gender identification, I hope this was not a choice and if it is a choice then it's a, uh, definitely a wrong answer here because gender identity has do has got nothing to do with the HCG levels, alright. So, uh, we cannot say if it is a high HCG, it's a male or a low HCG is a female or a low HCG is a male or vice versa. So, uh, there is no such correlation existing and I think that's, uh, you know, just a choice uh, given to fill up your four choices. So, definitely not the answer. So, answer is molar pregnancy. Now, question number 17, uh, what are the drugs used for medical abortion? Now, abortion, we all know that we can do medical abortion up to 7 weeks in a country and that is 99% successful. Of course, it is no ban that we can do it up to 9 weeks also, then it is 95% successful. Just that it is more successful till 7 weeks, so it is uh, approved till uh, seven weeks to do a medical abortion. It's not that we cannot do a medical abortion beyond seven weeks to nine weeks. Please understand, we have better success by medical abortion till seven weeks. Now, what are the drugs? We know mifepristone is given to uh, kill the fetus because it's an anti-progestin and mesoprostol is given to expel the fetus because it's a prostaglandin. So, we give mifepristone 200 milligrams uh, that is an anti-progestin that will kill the fetus and around 24 to 48 hours the choice given here was 48, 48, 48 for every, all these four. But around 24 hours to 48 hours later, once the baby is dead, we can start contracting the uterus by a prostaglandin to expel the fetus. So, mesoprostol 800 micrograms after 48 hours is given. So, mifepristone is given orally and mesoprostol is given vaginally. Of course, when you're giving a medical abortion, the prerequisites, the very important prerequisite is that you should always assess the location of the fetus. Please do not do a medical abortion without knowing that it's, it's inside the uterus. You should know it's inside the uterus, then only do a medical abortion, okay? Assess the location by an ultrasound and then explain regarding the drugs and the effects and then administer the drugs let the bleeding happen. Once the bleeding is over in 3-4 days, the patient comes back for a repeat ultrasound to know the completion of the evacuation. So, that's what is the method of doing a medical abortion. Location of the Bartholin's gland opening or the Bartholin cyst, you know, I've just given a choice. I don't know what was exactly asked. But yes, we know that it is the anterior two-third and the posterior one-third. Anterior two-third and the posterior one-third of the vulva, the opening of the Bartholin glands into the uh, uh, vestibule, okay. Now, this, uh, what is the vestibule and what is the vulva? I'll just try to explain you. So, location of the Bartholin gland or the Bartholin cyst is in the vestibule. It's not the vagina, okay. The vagina is the canal. Uh, the opening of the vaginal canal is within the vestibule. So, yes. So, the easy way to remember how to know where the opening is, just remember that the bathroom glands are known as the greater vestibular glands. So, vestibular glands will open in the vestibule. That's the easy way to remember and don't keep getting confused that it's in the vagina or in the vestibule. They are called the greater vestibular glands. So, they are a little distal to the opening of the hymen. They are not inside the vagina but outside the vagina. So, let me just try and show you what I uh, meant. Now, vestibule is enclosed. See, this is the vulva here. I have drawn like this. So, this is the vulva. Now, what is the vestibule? Now, vestibule is this, you know, the area which is enclosed by the heart line laterally. This is the heart's line here. This is the heart's line here. Okay. So, this is the heart's line laterally. External surface of the hymen medially. This is the external surface of the hymen. Okay. So, the external surface of the hymen and the heart line laterally. Clitoral frenulum anterally. The clitoral frenulum here anterally and the forchette posteriorly. This is the forchette. 
so that is the vestibule the fossate here posteriorly the collateral frenulum here and the heart's line here this is the heart's line so that is the vestibule now vestibule is a place you know that's a, a place where there are a lot of openings okay so vestibule has six openings the urethra opens here and then the vagina opens in the vestibule and two bartholin ducts also open here roughly here roughly here is the opening of the bartholin gland and two paraurethral glands also there the paraurethral glands of skin they are also here so there are six openings uh, two bartholin glands two paraurethral glands urethra and the vagina in the vestibule so the bartholin glands now the bartholin glands also known as the greater vestibular glands they are 0.5 to 1 cm in diameter the duct is around 1.5 to 2 cm long and they open around the 5 o'clock and the 7 o'clock position so i drew that for you 5 o'clock and 7 o'clock position but it is outside the hymen all right now the infection of this uh, bathroom gland which makes the bathroom's abscess you know very well it is uh, a very painful condition which requires a marsupialization you know all that very well but what is the infection of this bathroom gland mostly it is by mixed organisms yes uh, it can also be isolated be uh, with the uh, staph aureus infection but mostly it's a mixed infection which causes a bathroom's uh, abscess okay so this is one uh, picture of a bathroom's abscess where you can see it is the if you draw a line like this then this is the anterior two-third of the vulva and the posterior one-third of the vulva and you're seeing the bathroom gland is swollen up here so that is what is a bathroom cyst here. it's not infected it's not looking infected here it's the bathroom cyst here all right identify this instrument uh, i'm not too sure whether they asked you a curate this is a curate it has got two ends it's got a uh, you know the blunt end here and the sharp end here and this curate is the most favorite instrument of the gynecologist you know whenever we want to biopsy the uterine lining or we want to take out a fetus when we're doing an abortion so this is the instrument which is very helpful when we're doing that so-called dnc isn't it so this is a curate it is not a dilator dilator will be blunt and it is not a sound and it is not a vaginal valve retractor vaginal valve retractor will be much bigger there will be much bigger loops okay it will be something like this vaginal valve retractor will be and it will also have an angle like this vaginal valve retractor so yes it is not a vaginal valve retractor yes uh, the answer is b it's a curate now i've given you one more picture identify the instrument because i think some people said sir uh, curate was not asked a sound was asked so i've given you another picture now this is what is a uterine sound this is known as a uterine sound i'm just giving you another information here because uh, you know i've given you a picture of a curate here and let's see question number 19 with this picture the answer is curate but if this was a picture then the answer is a uterine sound now what's a uterine sound sounding means i want to sound you know i want to find out about the uterus so the uterine sound is put inside and i find out what is the depth of the uterus what is the angle of the antiversion or whether this is angle of retroversion so let me sound out the uterus you know when you go and find out about somebody you know when you want to go and find out uh, how is that person and whether this person is liable or not whether he's going to work or not so we go and say let me go and sound him up let me go and find out about him so that's the english language usage of the word as sound so this sound this instrument sound is also let me go and find out about the uterus let me sound the depth of the uterus so i go and find out the depth of the uterus by this instrument this is known as the uterine sound so yes this is how we do the sounding you know real time something like this and then uh, whatever you know how long it goes into the uterus then we uh, you know we put our fingers here then when we put the sound inside the uterus something like this when we put the sound where it stops at the cervix we put our finger and then we know what is the length of the utero cervical uh, distance how much it is so here we can see that the utero cervical distance is this much in this picture sounding the uterus so that is a sound question number 20 a young girl with complaints of not ending mitnak presents with periodic abdominal pain to the hospital on examination the following presentation image is seen 
what is the likely lesion this girl is suffering from. A girl who has not had periods till 16 and she is having a periodic abdominal pain that suggests that there is uh, probably formation of menstrual blood every month but it is not able to come out. The answer could be a transverse vaginal septum or an imperforate hymen. So when you see this picture, yes, there is no transverse vaginal septum in the choices but there is upfront choice A, imperforate hymen or is it a bathrensis? No bathrensis we just now saw. It's in the uh, much outside. It's somewhere here. The bathroom opening is here and bathroom cyst will look somewhere here. So that's not the answer. So it's not the bathroom cyst. Gartner cyst is inside the vagina. You know, Gartner cyst is not in the vulva. It's in the vagina. It will come here somewhere, a Gartner cyst. And we are talking about a cyst at this level right now. So this is not a Gartner cyst. Separate uterus, of course, is much higher. It's here, separate uterus. So it's not even a separate uterus. So definitely this picture is of an imperforate hymen. You can see the hymen opening is not cannulated. It is not a Mullerian defect. It's a cannulation defect. So yes, uh, if you see a hymen like this, what is the treatment? Under anesthesia, we would do a cruciate incision like this, a cross-shaped incision. So yes, uh, this video I think you must have seen in a couple of demonstrations earlier also. So I'm making a cross shape incision. Can you see exactly like a cross? We're making incision on the uh, hymen. Then now I'll turn the blade and uh, deepen this cut ends. And once I do that, see all that pent up uh, menstrual blood will start coming out. So that is what is a cruciate incision. Once you make this incision, then you cut along the edges also like this so that the cut ends don't close. So finally, it becomes something like this. The hymenal opening will become something like this. All right. So question number 21. What is the reason of abdominal pain to, um, to the mother when she is breastfeeding her newborn baby? So you know that when the baby is suckling on the breast, the milk let down. Yes, milk production is because of prolactin, but the milk let down. It happens in response to the suckling of the child on the breast and this milk let down is brought about by oxytocin. Now that oxytocin, you know, is also going to be, apart from giving the milk let down, it is also going to be circulating in the uh, blood of the mother and this oxytocin will reach the uterus and that uterus will contract and respond to the oxytocin. It's a good thing, right? A woman who's delivered and now she's breastfeeding the child the oxytocin will go and contract the uterus so that there is no bleeding. The bleeding will be much lesser and also the contraction is going to slowly involute the uterus. The uterus is going to go back to its normal size. All right. So the involution of the uterus is helped by the breastfeeding of the child Okay, because of the oxytocin which is released. So that contraction is what is going to cause pain. So answer is oxytocin definitely. Most of you knew the answer. That's a very simple one that whenever a woman is breastfeeding her child, that oxytocin, which is causing the milk letdown, also goes and contracts the uterus. So every time she breastfeeds the child, especially a newborn child, that time the woman experiences abdominal cramps. So answer is D, oxytocin. Which of the following is treatment for decubitus ulcers in uterine prolapse? So when the uterus has come out of the vagina, if you see this, this is the vagina and the uterus inside. Now the uterus is hanging out. If you can see this uterus is hanging out of the vagina like this. So this band of the vagina here, this uterus when it is hanging out, you know, I'll try to show you with my hand. So this is the uterus and this is the vagina. So when the uterus comes out of the vagina like this, see now the uterus is hanging out. So this vagina is going to make a tight band on the uterus. So you can see that this band of the vaginal muscles on the uterus which is hanging out it is not going to allow the venous return see the blood flow the blood flow into the uterus by the uterine arteries you know the blood pressure is 120 by 80 the pulse pressure is much higher in a uh, artery so the blood will come into the uh, uterus because of high arterial pressure but the venous return will be compromised so this uterus which is hanging out of the vagina will be congested with what kind of blood? Venous blood, which is deoxygenated blood. So yes, that uterus, which is going to have some amount of scrapes, you know, some scrapes can happen 
when the woman is sitting uh, you know it'll rub against the undergarments it'll rub on the chair if she's sitting so that small amount of uh, bruises on the uterine surface will they heal or will they not heal they will not heal because this is now having deoxygenated blood this deoxygenated blood will have poor healing capacities so this uterus which is having deoxygenated blood will have these small small ulcers on the cervix and they will not heal so the best option is to push this uterus back inside and once you push this uterus back inside then i can put some packs here i can put some packs here like a large uh, dressing which will keep the uterus inside and this dressing will also have some amount of glycerin in it so this packing with glycerin with glycerin which has a hygroscopic action so i use a glycerin pack which will keep the uterus inside and also suck out the fluids from this congested hypertrophic uterus so a hygroscopic action of the glycerin will help it will keep the uterus inside and also shrink the uterus and yes what else will happen once the uterus is back inside the venous return will happen and the fresh blood will come so that fresh blood will also cause healing so we get two uh, benefits one is that there is healing because of packing and then also there is reduction in the cervical edema so if you're planning your surgery on this prolapse you will not want to operate on a uterus which is not vascular because you may chop the uterus but the vagina lens which you're going to suture when you do the surgery and remove the uterus the vagina has to be closed behind the uterus which has gone off the vaginal vault has to be closed but now if that is a deoxygenated vagina then the healing will also be poor so even if you're planning a surgery later you want the tissues to have good oxygenation you cannot just operate on a uterus which is having deoxygenated blood so to get a patient have to have relief and also to prepare her for the surgery this packing is very useful so we pack it by glycerin we also add some amount of acriflavin so glycerin is the hygroscopic action and the acriflavin is the antiseptic action all right glycerin acriflavin packing we do okay we can also do a max self dressing also we can do a magnesium sulfate dressing also so answer for this question is d now what is the meek syndrome now uh, whenever we discuss ovarian tumors we discuss such great lengths of ovarian tumors we discuss about so many different type of tumors and the full classification of the epithelial tumors and then the classification of the germ cell tumors sex cord tumors but then uh, one passing mention we always make about the uh, the the sex cord tumors is that uh, you know apart from the granulosa cell tumors there are the theca cell tumors and there are also the fibromas and the fibromas are benign tumors now fibromas of the ovary along with ascites and pleural effusion that meek syndrome we always teach you and uh, we are always thinking that it is a very simple topic and it's not going to come in the exam but yes uh, it's good to know complicated stuff but don't forget the easy stuff like this meek syndrome is fibroma of the ovary ascites and pleural effusion which is written as hydrothoraxia so answer is a meek syndrome is fibroma ascites and pleural effusion and if you replace the fibroma any other ovarian tumor any other ovarian tumor maybe a brenner tumor plus ascites plus pleural effusion now that is what is known as the pseudo meek syndrome so meek syndrome is what i told you pseudo meek syndrome is any other ovarian tumor with a satis and pleural effusion and pseudo meek syndrome most common cause is the brenner tumor all right maybe for the pg entrance exam it's a good practice already okay question number 24 cost evasion for cn3 or was it ca cervix uh, either way the answer is not going to change when i say cn3 cn3 is what is going to cause uh, ca cervix in 10 years isn't it so whether it's cn3 or ca cervix either way the answer is not going to change it is 
human papilloma virus. So, what is the, uh, you know, the most common agent and which is the most malignant agent? You know, that could be the uh, question which they can ask. But then, uh, there was no 16 here. Now, again, you know, some questions like, you know, the uh, question on hypertensive uh, drug of choice in pregnancy, antihypertensive. Now, they did not give you labetalol as a choice. Then they did not give you 34 as a choice for amniotic fluid. So, there is a lot of questions which we are a little away from the normal this time. So, yes, the most common agent which causes CIN3 actually is, most common agent actually is the type 16, the serotype 16 of human papillomavirus and the most malignant is 18. So, yes, cost of agent for CIN3 or CSRVX in this MCQ, the answer is HPV 18. Now, um, you know, there's a lot of vaccines which are given for this and we've been discussing about the vaccines, although I'm not in much favor about them because there's so many serotypes which can cause CA cervix. But yes, there are some good vaccines coming in now and the Gardasil 9 which has come now, the Gardasil 9, we call it a non-avalent vaccine now. It's got 9 serotypes against which there is protection because of this vaccine. So, 6, 11, 16, 18, 31, 33, 45, 52 and 58. This also came as an MCQ once. What are the serotypes which are covered by Gardasil 9? So, yes, the non-avalent vaccine Gardasil 9 is in vogue now. But yes, it is still not going to protect against all the serotypes which are described. Company actually says that you should give it to women between 6 to 25. But what is the FDA approval? You can give it to all people, all women, 9 to 45 years, whether they are women or they are men, because the virus is going to reach the women through men. So, what they say that give the vaccine to all the girls between 9 to 45 and give it to all the men also between 9 to 45. So, basically, they want to immunize the whole humanity so that they make a lot of money. That's what is my take on this, because uh, ultimately, I feel that there are so many serotypes which can cause CA cervix. So, uh, you using this on each and everybody to prevent against uh, CA cervix, well, that could be a strategy, but it's a very expensive strategy. What I've always told you that uh, keeping a good, uh, healthy, clean life and a very uh, sincere, dedicated life to your partner, that is uh, far more prevention effective, you know, that is far more effective prevention against CA cervix than all these vaccines. But then, yes, we are not talking about holistic stuff here, aren't we? We are talking about prevention of CSR by vaccine and Gardasil 9 is a good method of doing that. Okay, we will take question number 25 now. Uh, an infant is brought to the casualty with dehydration and tachycardia. The genitalia is ambiguous. Blood work shows hyponatremia and hyperkalemia. Now, this is a case of congenital adrenal hyperplasia. You know that better than me. But uh, when there is ambiguous genitalia, we think in terms of congenital adrenal hyperplasia. We think in terms of a boy who's probably got undescended testes, or we also think in terms of uh, uh, some variants of the androgen insensitivity syndrome. Now, in congenital adrenal hyperplasia, apart from the ambiguous genitalia, they are concentrating here on the electrolyte imbalance. And two set of questions were sent to me. One said the same information with uh, what is the reason for this congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And the second uh, question was the same information with the second question, which of the following will be high in this condition. So, before we give you these answers, let us see the steroid genesis, steroidogenesis in the adrenal gland, where the cholesterol is broken down to pregnenolone. Now, pregnenolone breaks down to 17 hydroxypregnenolone, and then 17 hydroxypregnenolone will uh, break down to dehydroepiandosterone. Now, this pregnenolone will convert to progesterone and progesterone will also convert to 17 hydroxy progesterone, which will convert to androstene down. Now, this is the pathway which is making the androgens. Now, when we see the lateral uh, pathway of the same substrates, now progesterone will convert to deoxycortisone, which will convert into cortisone. Now, cortisone is the mineralocorticoid, which also gives rise to aldosterone. Now, 17 hydroxy progesterone will convert to deoxycortisol, which is going to make cortisol finally. Cortisol is the glucocorticoid. So, mineralocorticoids and glucocorticoids are made in this pathway, and the androgens are made in this side of the pathway. Now, we know that the cholesterol breakdown in the adrenal gland is going to give the steroids and the androgens. Now, in the steroid pathway, the main enzyme is this 21 hydroxylase here. 
Now, this 21 hydroxylase, if there is a deficiency, then these steroids are not made. When there is 21 hydroxylase deficiency, these steroids will not be made and the aldosterone will not be made. So, when the aldosterone is not made, you know, aldosterone is known for the sodium retention in the body along with the water retention. So, when there is loss of, uh, when there is no aldosterone, there is loss of sodium and along with sodium, the water is pulled out. So, there is dehydration. Now, when there is loss of positive ions like sodium, to compensate for the loss of positive ions, intracellular potassium comes out and that potassium causes hyperkalemia. So, hyponatremia, dehydration and the hyperkalemia can be fatal for the newborn. Now, this particular variation is known as the salt losing type, the salt losing type of the congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So, the most common cause of this congenital adrenal hyperplasia is the 21 hydroxylase deficiency. So, for this variation 1, you know, question number 25 with this uh, question, if it, this was asked, what is the reason for this uh, condition? It is 21 hydroxylase deficiency. But if the question was something different, that same information with which of the following will be high in this condition? So, you must understand that the pathway has stopped here. These are not being formed. So, what will be high in this condition? Then this pathway, can you see? All of these will be made more. These will be made more in amount. And this uh, other part, the milocorticoids and the glucocorticoids are not made, but the pathway where the androgens are made that would be excess. Now androgens can be made even from the ovaries. So that's why what is specific in this pathway if you look at these 17 ketosteroids. If the 17 ketosteroids are high then we know that the adrenal gland which has got the production of steroids not happening that adrenal gland is now getting stimulated by the brain to go on making more and more androgens. So, before the androgens, the 17 ketosteroids, these byproducts will be much higher also in the circulation along with the androgens. So, that's what is given here. Which of the following will be high in this condition? And that is 17 hydroxy progesterone will be high in this condition. So, please, I'm not saying there are two answers to this question. I'm saying there were two sets of questions sent to me by the students. One was the same information with choice one. For that, answer is D. And if it was question number two, for that, the answer is A. All right. So, please uh, note these answers. And both these options can come in the exams. And I'm sure you can manage them very well. So, this particular, uh, you know, the chart which I've given you in your prep notes also. And we've discussed this in the classes. Please make sure that you remember this chart. It is very handy for you. Even if you're doing uh, not gynae, but you're doing pediatrics or you're doing dermatology or medicine, endocrinology, everywhere this chart will be asked. All right. Next question, number 26. A patient underwent radiotherapy for CS cervix. Which organ in the pelvis is most radiosensitive? So, when radiation is given to the pelvis, we must understand a very delicate organ, ovary is there in the pelvis and that ovary with radiation gets totally destroyed. And that's also a reason where some women who get too many CT scans or X-rays done, they can get into premature ovarian failure. So remember, ovary is extremely radio sensitive. And yes, uh, radiation injuries can happen to the urethra and the urinary bladder also. But the most sensitive organ to radiation damage is the ovary. But mark my words, I mean the normal ovary. Normal ovary. Normal ovary is very radio sensitive but ovarian cancer is radio resistant whatever we've discussed in the management of ovarian cancer we've discussed surgical management of removal and staging and then we've discussed of chemotherapy. We've not discussed radiation because radiation is useless in the management of ovarian tumors. Only radio sensitive tumor you know is dysgeminoma. I mean I can write that here so that you don't get uh, confused except dysgeminoma. All right. So most radio sensitive pelvic organ is the ovary. 
Now, question number 27, epithelium of the fallopian tube is. Now, fallopian tube epithelium, all of you know, is a ciliated columnar epithelium because it is required for the, uh, the columnar epithelium is required, the cilia is required for the transfer of the oocytes towards the uterus. So, ciliated columnar epithelium is there in the fallopian tube. Uh, let's see what are the other epitheliums in the uterus and now. So, fallopian tube is ciliated columnar epithelium. The uterus, the epithelium of the uterus is columnar epithelium, has got this microvilli in this. So, yes, we can uh, say that the epithelium of the endometrium is columnar and you know it is shedding, it is growing and shedding every month, but the basic epithelium is ciliated columnar, which has got some microvilli. Now, what is the epithelium of the cervix and the uh, cervix you must know it has got an endo cervix and an exo cervix be very careful here that when we talk of the cervix part which is outside let me draw the vagina here first now the vagina i'll tell you first vagina is a non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium and the exo cervix is also stratified squamous epithelium now the endo cervix is columnar epithelium now endo cervix is columnar the exo cervix is squamous that's why you have a transformation zone here there's a transformation zone here which we have read that where a columnar epithelium is actively dividing and becoming a squamous that's a squamous columnar junction or the transformation zone which is most susceptible for the HPV to cause changes and cause dysplasia the first place where dysplasia starts I want to tell you something else that the internal loss is here, the external loss is here, but the internal loss, there are two types of internal loss. One is the anatomical internal loss and the other is the histological internal loss. Now, why am I interested in telling you the difference in these two? Because the columnar epithelium of the uterus, the uh, microvilli containing columnar epithelium, the ciliated columnar epithelium of the uterus, now will change its variety at the endocervix where it becomes a columnar epithelium here. So, histologically, the epithelium changes at the histological internal os. Anatomically, the internal loss starts much before. So, anatomical internal loss is a little high, the place where you can see the internal loss starting. But histologically, the place where the histology changes, the ciliated columnar epithelium of the uterus changes into a columnar epithelium at the level of the histological internal loss. So, am I telling you this repeatedly? The area between the anatomical and the histological internal loss this area, this area is known as the isthmus. This area is known as the isthmus. The area between the anatomical and the histological internal loss is known as the isthmus. And this isthmus later in labor becomes the lower segment. So, the isthmus here is roughly around 0.5 centimeters and labor it may become up to 6 to 7 centimeters the lower segment. Alright, so that's about the epithelium and I thought I'll just uh, push in some information about the isthmus and the importance of the anatomical and the histological internal loss and remember the anatomical internal loss is higher. Okay, so let's see question number 28. Which of the following conditions is an absolute contraindication for breastfeeding? Now, when we say breastfeeding, uh, remember one thing, the straightaway contraindication here is choice D. I'll tell you about the other choices, but galactosemia is a condition where the baby cannot utilize the galactose and that buildup of galactose is detrimental for the liver, for the eye, for the ovary. There are so many problems of galactosemia and you people have been taught by the biochemists so well and uh, I'm, let's not go into much detail about this, but galactosemia is an outright contraindication for breastfeeding and A, B, C are not contraindications. Now, let's see a little bit about them. What are the outright contraindications? Must remember, if a person is a drug abuser using alcohol, then there is galactosemia like I told you or the person is undergoing a breast cancer treatment. Outright contraindications. Again, HIV infection, active and untreated tuberculosis and hepatitis V, they are also contraindications. But yes, we know very well that in our country, 
If we don't breastfeed our children, our children will die for the want of breast milk rather than these infections. These infections may cause a problem, but before that the children will die because of for the want of breast milk because of not getting breast milk they may die before so we say in developing countries or in underdeveloped countries these are not truly contraindications because in these countries we will give breastfeed to these children so that the basic nourishment is given to these children they are not deprived of the outright basic nourishment yes we can give in hiv along with the giving a navy rapin syrup to the child We can give in tuberculosis along with an INH syrup prophylaxis and hepatitis B also we can breastfeed if you give the immunoglobin to the child at birth. So all of these which are actual contraindications, these are not contraindications in developing countries except countries like India, isn't it, developing countries. Now, maternal hepatitis C is not a contraindication because uh, hepatitis C is not known to transmit through the breast milk. So, let's go into a little bit detail about this. Cytomegalovirus, remember, we don't see the choices given here away. Cytomegalovirus, um, hepatitis C virus and herpes simplex virus. So, I just want to tell you some information about them. Now, cytomegalovirus, the mother who's got cytomegalovirus will transmit the virus, no doubt, but will also transmit the antibodies. So, that's why there is protection because of uh, cytomegalovirus being such a common infection in the community. There is inherent immunity. So, when the mother is transmitting the virus, she's also transmitting the antibodies. So, the baby is safe. Then, hepatitis B virus, of course, we can give uh, hepatitis B infected mothers. We can ask them to breastfeed the child when the child has been given the immunoglobin, which we just now discussed. The maternal hepatitis C is not a contraindication because breastfeeding has not been shown to transmit the infections. And women with active herpes simplex virus, yes, may have the infant suckling on them because if there are no active breast lesions, right now the mother who has got herpes simplex virus but does not have any active breast lesions, she can breastfeed the child. The transmission will not happen if she's very uh, careful about her hygiene. She washes her hands regularly and there are no breast lesions. She can also breastfeed the child. So, yes, uh, there was uh, some confusion regarding a uh, herpes simplex virus, but galactosemia, outright contraindication. In these, we can breastfeed. So, answer to question number 28 is D. Okay. Question number 29, ultrasound image of uterus shows a snowstorm appearance. Now, they've given you one question so that they make sure you get this one mark. And snowstorm appearance of uh, ultrasound is classic of a complete mole. Yes. And um, partial mole will show a fetus and a partially degenerated placenta. Corecarcinoma is a lesion where there is a very vascular lesion which does not show vesicles. It's a, a fleshy mass which is very vascular. So, on the ultrasound, you will see a large lesion which is invading into the muscle probably and very vascular and it is not going to give this snowstorm appearance definitely. Adenomyces is a uniformly large uterus where there is myohyperplasia. The muscular layer of the uterus is much enlarged, has got this dash and dot appearance like we discussed in radiology. It has got this loss of the junctional zone. So many other things is there in adenomyces but not snowstorm appearance. So this is very classical of hyridiform mole. Easy question. I think they wanted to give you some uh, marks straight away. Uh, apart from these 29 questions, there were some, uh, you know, very partial recalls and they were, you know, only one line is given to me. I thought uh, since I don't have the choices probably, at least I'll discuss, uh, you know, the outright answers of these one-liners so that at least we know what are the topics which are important to read for the exams. So, there was this x-ray which was showing uh, in a woman there is a cannonball appearance on the chest x-ray. So, cannonball appearance on the chest x-ray could be a medicine question also, but then I can also contribute that uh, cannonball secondary to the lung can come from a courier carcinoma. So, yes, if it was a woman with cannonball appearance, so it could be a Corio carcinoma, which is causing that. I am not too sure of the choices. Now, what is the most common sites of metastasis in a Corio carcinoma? Maybe this was the question. So, the most common site of metastasis is lung. So, that's why when we have, uh, uh, you know, the staging of the trophoblastic diseases, stage 1 is in the uterus, 
stage 2 is in the pelvis and stage 4 is distant metastasis but there is a separate stage 3 which is for the lung so please remember lung is the most common site of metastasis so there is a stage just given for the lung lung metastasis stage 3 any other metastasis all of the body is stage 4 so which ovarian tumor has all the three germ layers now i don't know whether this was a question and the choices what were asked there's a straightforward question about a dermoid or maybe the choice was uh, teratoma it could be a teratoma which they'll say a benign teratoma that also could have been a choice so dermoid or a benign cystic teratoma both could be the choices where all the three germ layers are seen and you know teratomas are only 10 percent malignant 90 percent are benign and the benign teratomas are known as dermoids or benign cystic teratomas infant of a diabetic mother has which are the following i don't know what were the choices but then most common association metabolic problem of an infant of a diabetic mother whether it is pre existing diabetes or gestation diabetes the mother is suffering from the most common problem of a newborn is a hypoglycemia that is simply because the mother has a lot of sugar which is given to the fetus when the baby is inside the mother it is known as a fetus and fetus has a lot of sugar and when the fetus has a lot of sugar fetus makes a lot of insulin from the pancreas and now he is used to that high sugar and high insulin moment he is born he is detached from the mother so his high insulin is going to cause him severe hypoglycemia because immediately when he is born he is not going to start suckling on the mother and make sure that he is going to fulfill his demand of glucose so these newborn babies which are born to mothers who got diabetes are on a very very high risk of having hypoglycemia even neonatal death so that's why it's a criteria for admission any mother who's got gdm or over diabetes who delivers the baby even if he's healthy at birth he's kept in the nursery for one day that's a criteria for nursery admission okay now there was a question on the antral follicle you know they had given you uh, a picture of the ovary was it with uh, you know various stages of the follicles from you know primordial to antral to pre antral i think to then uh, a mature follicle and a follicle which is ruptured and a corpus sutum i don't know and then they had marked something so i'm not too sure of the question so most of you said the answer was straight away antral follicle because that's how you have shown us in the app and you've shown the antral follicle so if uh, you knew the answer is antral follicle antral follicle is a fluid filled follicle you'll see granulosa cells all over the follicle and this follicle is filled up with fluid so preantral follicle does not have a fluid it's a small follicle then it becomes bigger and this antral follicle means a follicle with an antrum antrum is a potential space where fluid can be held so antral follicle when they say a fluid filled follicle so if that picture was of a fluid filled follicle that's why i think most of you when you saw that you immediately marked antral isn't it fluid filled follicle so yes the first chapter on menstrual physiology you discussed about the antral follicle and if you remember that one i'm sure you'll get this one also right okay so these were some of the questions where uh, i did not have uh, too many good choices but i thought we'll nevertheless discuss the one liner so that we know what are the topics which are going to come in the exams so please do find time to read about, read about these uh, uh, five topics also apart from the 29 which we discussed and uh, yes um, uh, fairly expected questions which came in the exams and two three questions they did not give you the uh, the answers which you were expecting like the question on uh, methyl dopa isn't it so yes uh, these variations also keep happening the question banks are made many years back sometimes and if they picked up an old question from the question bank then that is the result some uh, of uh, uh, what happened in your exam this time so it doesn't matter and uh, those who have read well will be able to answer most of these questions which were asked in knobs and guiding this time and i'm sure all of you had actually read well so best wishes for the results of this exam and may all of you make it this time and uh, we shall meet when we're reading for the PG entrance exam next time. All right, all the best. <laughs>